Hello, I'm David Lockington, Music Director of your Pasadena Symphony, and I want to welcome you to the second program in our Pasadena Presents series. This is a great adventure for all of us, and I hope you'll feel inspired by the artistry of our own musicians and the wonderful soloists we're bringing to you at the magnificent Ambassador Auditorium. Today we're presenting Brahms' Clarinet Quintet and Beethoven's Violin Concerto. So to start, here is Brahms around the time of the writing of the quintet in his late 50s. Like Mozart, Brahms wrote important works in later life for the clarinet. Both were inspired by the particular artistry of players who came to their attention just at the right moment. This is Richard Mühlfeld, Brahms' new friend, who had started as a violinist and turned to the clarinet in the Meiningen Court Orchestra. Now, since 1880, Hans von Bülow had been their music director. This is the same man that premiered Tchaikovsky's first piano concerto in Boston, where, incidentally, under an exit sign, the words continued, in case of Brahms. Brahms' Fourth Symphony was premiered in Meiningen in 1885. So Brahms had heard the clarinetist Mühlfeld, but it wasn't until he played various concertos by Mozart, Weber, and Spohr that Brahms fell in love with Fräulein Clarinette. So what was it about the tone of the clarinet that appealed to him? The great pianist Clara Schumann, widow of Robert Schumann, and Brahms' lifelong friend, was about 70 when she heard the clarinet quintet, and she wrote, how subtle the fusion of the instruments with the soft and insistent wail of the clarinet above them lays hold of one. Wail seems an odd choice of words because it was the sweetness of Mühlfeld's tone which brought Brahms out of retirement following the string sextet. Now, the clarinet doesn't employ vibrato like singers or other woodwind instruments, so I don't think it was operatic drama Brahms was going for. The music that arises through the almost serene, disembodied tone of the clarinet from both Mozart and Brahms is often soothing and autumnal. Perhaps the wailing was more a description of the yearning that Brahms's music expresses. Brahms uses the clarinet's lyricism to cast an almost pastoral spell in the first movement of the quintet. At the same time, he enjoys employing the full range of the instrument, which is often dramatic. In the second movement, we have maybe a flashback to one of his earliest influences when he was touring with the Hungarian violinist Remenyi in his early 20s. And in this photograph, Brahms is standing up. The improvised sounding middle section of the slow movement sounds like we're at a gypsy fireside. Also in this movement, Brahms seems to be foreshadowing the blues. The top note of the violin phrase you're about to hear clashes with the chord beneath it, creating the famous blue note phenomenon. The clarinet in the quintet is both the leader and a supporter. Don Foster, 
will often be playing an octave below Sarah, the first violinist. He provides a resonant cushion for her soaring, intense high tone. When the clarinet is subtly embedded in the string quartet texture, it adds a warmth which softens everything and makes it glow. Here are our other musicians. Mei Chang, Carrie Holtzman, and Dane Little. The clarinet quintet is an enigmatic work. It's definitely reflective, but there are also sunny patches. It appears to begin in carefree D major, but the yearning home key of B minor is soon established. it almost breaks into a popular song. But then veers sideways into shadowy harmonic canals. and dangerous rhythmic undertones. The emotional sands are constantly shifting and sometimes it's hard to gain a footing. Brahms and Wagner were the most sophisticated composers of the late 19th century. Like Wagner who constructed epic operas, Brahms writes in a through-composed way, which is to say that phrases are often long, take time to resolve, and then in a blink, they dovetail into the next miraculous unfolding. The emotional narrative always feels organic, but somehow Brahms, compared to Wagner, condenses the profundity of what he has to say within traditional length forms. His miracles are micro, where Wagner's are macro. I think it's Brahms' harmonic control, which somehow gives us the sense that more time has passed than is actually the case. It's a kind of emotional suspended animation. And I think here's where the clarinet tone comes in again. The clarinet has in its repertoire that quality of an inhalation and a very slowly controlled exhalation. Just try that for a minute and see how you feel. Suddenly you notice things in that moment of interior silence, a kind of stopping of motion and time. Brahms was nearly 60 when the clarinet became his muse and it's a beautiful tender match for his mature emotions. The third movement begins and ends with such innocent sweetness which recalls the beautiful clarinet line that opens the third movement of his first symphony from decades earlier. Words that come to mind are autumnal, acceptance, nostalgia, something unrequited. The playful scherzo, which is the filling in the middle of this movement, is lively, dancing, and sometimes stormy.
The ending of the quintet is deeply enigmatic. As in his fourth symphony, Brahms begins this finale with a set of variations. After a number of contrasting explorations, the viola leads a beautifully sad and poignant slow waltz following a lovely sunny close in the major. Incidentally, Johann Strauss was Brahms' favorite popular composer. He went regularly to hear his outdoor lunchtime concerts. He even gave his autograph to somebody with a quote from the Blue Danube Waltz, writing, unfortunately not by Johannes Brahms. But back to our dreamy viola. Brahms seems to be enjoying this bittersweet waltzing moment and then, in the same tempo, he unexpectedly slides into the lilting phrase which opens the whole quintet. It's a breathtaking change of course, because suddenly, the momentum of the variations is halted. Is this a moment of repose to be continued? Well, as Brahms proceeds, he seems to ask a dark question. It's almost as if he doesn't have the energy to go back to the variations or that he said enough, or, or he said it all before. It's hard to get a handle on exactly what's, what's going on. And then he interrupts this wistfulness with the powerful chord and echo, which ends the piece in B minor. It's dramatic, and since it's clearly not heroic, seems almost tinged with bitterness. In a way, Brahms had said it all. He'd practically given up composing before the final clarinet chamber works. This quintet enabled him to ruminate, improvise, and explore his inner life on an intimate stage, not the big public spaces where his luxurious symphonies were performed. The premiere was given in 1891 with his great collaborator and friend, Josef Joachim, leading the quintet. They had had a long relationship with a painful separation that had only recently been somewhat tentatively mended through the vehicle of the double concerto Brahms had written for him and the cellist in his quartet, Robert Hausmann. The quintet carries the resonance of so many relationships of love unrequited, of adventure and passion, and concludes with a sting embedded in a sigh. Like Brahms, Beethoven was also inspired to write his violin concerto for a particular performer, in this case, Franz Clement, who had apparently helped Beethoven with parts of his opera Fidelio. Not only that, but it was premiered at a concert to raise money for the violinist in 1806, at the same time that Beethoven was writing his fifth and sixth symphonies. Since Mozart had started doing this kind of benefit concert in the 1780s, in order to remain independent of patronage, everybody was now doing it, including Beethoven, of course, who was well known for carefully managing his own financial affairs, 
sometimes brazenly playing off his publishers against each other. Beethoven started out as a prodigy keyboard player in Bonn, but also, like Bach and Mozart, played a string instrument, in his case the viola. So string techniques came naturally to him. In the progressive city of Bonn, he was a child of the Enlightenment. So when the French Revolution erupted, he was enraptured, as we know from his Eroica Symphony being originally dedicated to Napoleon in 1803, near the beginning of what we call his heroic decade. Since he was enamored of things French, it's not surprising that his music was also influenced by French composers of the time. It's the style of Viotti, an Italian who caused a sensation in the early 1780s in Paris and is considered the founding father of the French school of violin playing. It's Viotti's style that we hear mostly in the violin writing. The heroic expansiveness of the first movement also reflects French influence, mostly of another Italian expat, Cherubini. The violin concerto is long, about 45 minutes, and it's revolutionary. We know it's going to be quite a journey by the way it begins, with five simple strokes on the timpani. At the time, this probably would have been recognizable to educated listeners as an echo of heroic French music. It is static, spacious, and sets the scene for the serene D major melody answer from the woodwinds. As expected, those timpani strokes become hammer blows later on. Beethoven has practically written an overture before the violin comes in, and when it does, it enters almost as if it's improvising a warm-up. The figuration of sixth and octaves is one of Viotti's trademark features. Backing up, one of the moments I love is the extraordinary development of the timpani opening idea. It's actually implied in the dramatic silence. When the orchestra stops, I always feel an implied timpani heartbeat in the empty measure. It's critical that it's exactly in time. Before this concerto, Beethoven's audiences had experienced his new forms and long exegesis, but they had never heard the first movement of a violin concerto lasting more than 20 minutes. Sadly, the first performance was not a success. Unlike the Eroica of a few years before, which was rehearsed exhaustively, the violin concerto was barely ready days before the performance. The soloist, Franz Clement, was practically sight-reading his part at the performance, and there's a story that after the first movement, or maybe at the end, it's not quite clear, perhaps to reassure the audience that the investment in a ticket was justified, he played a piece of his own on one string holding the violin upside down. The first movement is demanding, not only from a stamina point of view, but also in the exposure of the writing. It lies very high on the instrument, most of the time, with constant figuration weaving around melodies, spinning intricate tales. The second movement feels like everything you believe has been stripped to its barest essence. The orchestra plays soft cadential figures.
and the violin hovers, suspended like a frozen bird song at times. It's not until the end that the solo part carries a full melodic line shining with the warm acceptance of truth. It's extraordinary that Beethoven could reach such a point, knowing that his hearing and performing days were numbered. And then he turns to entertain us in the last movement with a celebratory dance. The Pastoral Symphony was in the works at the time, and this music could have been turned into a perfect symphonic movement congruent with that theme. It wasn't until nearly 40 years later that this concerto got a fair hearing and entered the repertoire permanently. It was Mendelssohn that took the young 12-year-old Joachim to London, and it was there that a fabulous career and a revolutionary concerto was successfully launched onto the world stage. We are delighted to present Angelo Zhang Yu and Sing Yi two wonderful young musicians who have the artistry and virtuosity to bring this great concerto alive. Well, Angelo, it's wonderful to see you again back in Pasadena. Oh, I'm so happy to be here again. It was not long ago, two years ago, 2018, I believe it was in May, and I played um, two back-to-back concert actually in the, in the same day, <laughs> the yes. Beethoven Concerto, and you conducted the uh, Eroica Symphony. I still feel like yesterday. It's amazing that you can do two performances in one day of such a huge concerto. Wow, it's a once in a lifetime experience <laughs> for sure, because you know, it's as the most difficult violin concerto um, ever, you know, you actually want to do it twice. You. It, it really requires a lot of energy and focus and physical, physical, you know, toughness as well. You know, you, you, you just have to have everything. So yeah, it was quite a day for me. <laughs> well, I first heard you a number of years ago playing Bach and wow. I fell in love with your playing oh, then. Oh, that's so nice. And what you brought to it was a breathing kind of, and simplicity isn't the right word exactly, but in a lot of your semplice kind of playing, there's deep pathos. And, and I find that you bring that kind of sensibility to the Beethoven as well. There's passion and, I mean, in the, the, the Chrysler cadenza, there's every bit of virtuosity and passion you could possibly want. But you, your range of emotion is so enormous and your gestural playing is so gorgeous. Oh, thank you, thank you. That's so, so nice to hear from a musician like you because that means a lot to me. I mean, I, I, I've always been a musician who is looking for you know, different colors, a variety of dynamics and um, you know, different layers of expressions. And I think it's very important because you wanted to make sure the audience can feel that when you're playing it, and I always like to sort of build a connection between myself and the audience. And I feel like sometimes I'm playing with enormous sound and they, they were so excited, they were like, they're with me, but when I'm playing something so soft and whispering, they almost have to put their ear in the front row to hear what I'm trying to say. So that's a beautiful connection and that's why I love live performance so much and I miss the stage so much. <laughs>
Yes, so have you done any playing during this uh, COVID time? Uh, unfortunately, only live streaming and um, you know, online concerts um, through different platform, for example, violin channel and some other organizations. But this, pro this is probably the first time after or during the pandemic that I am actually playing uh, on a real stage. So it feels a little rusty at first, I must admit. <laughs> but it's a different sensation very. altogether, isn't it? You can't practice the way you play in a performance. Yeah. It's impossible, no, even absolutely. when there's no audience here. Absolutely. It's just a different feeling. Totally different feeling. So what do you have coming up? I believe I have some concerts in China in the next month or so. And I'll be back um, at the beginning of next year and uh, playing Mendelssohn Concerto with the Omaha Symphony and then play Four season in Texas. Hopefully those concerts are still happening and I will keep my fingers crossed because I miss the stage and I miss my audience. Yes. Where have you been during this time? Where's your home? Um, I live in Boston, and, um, and I also commute between Boston and New Jersey a little bit. Um, I find it, you know, almost a relief in the beginning of the pandemic. I feel like, okay, after all the travelings from place to place and lots of, you know, concerts, I finally can catch a break and to really look into myself a little deeper and to read some books that I always wanted to read but never had the time, and to learn the pieces that I always wanted to learn but just were so preoccupied before that. So yeah, it was actually um, a good experience for me, but then as the time goes on, I just feel like my sort of the anxiety of really wanting to go back to the stage is getting stronger and stronger because I do miss the feeling of the human connection between the audience and myself. So yeah, so it's a mixture of both, I would say. I appreciate the fact I had the time to rest and to um, digest many of the things that I didn't have the time to, but also at the same time, I just wanted to get back uh, to, the, to the stage and play for everybody. So tell me the best book you read during this time. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's a um, detective book um, by a Japanese author. Um, I, I, I doubt if I can say that in English because <laughs> I didn't read it in English. But I also um, re reread uh, uh, my, my favorite novel, uh, The Unbearable Lightness of Being oh, by yes. Milan Kundera for the third time. Uh, yeah, every time I read it, I just feel like it's a new book to me. I discover something that I've never seen before. And I feel like with age, it also matters. You know, when I read it for the first time when I was 18 and then 22, now 31, every time it's a different experience. You obviously um, can relate yourself much more as I grow older. Yeah. And tell me what pieces you have been learning. It's, it's interesting because um, I actually learned the Stravinsky Violin Concerto and the Barbo Violin Concerto among others. And those two concertos are the concertos that I, I never really loved from the beginning when I first heard it. But then, I think since last year, I just feel like, you know, there is always a jewel in every single piece. So I think it is my fault not to even give them a chance. Mm. So I allow myself to open up and to discover behind the black and white, the notes, the paper, and I really discover the beauty of these pieces. And I, I fall in love with those two pieces. And, you know, again, I mean, thanks to the pandemic, I actually had the time to really, you know, dig in to the pieces and was able to really connect myself to the piece. Now I'm in love with those pieces. So and they're so different. Very, from the very, very, very different in their own ways. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's just been so nice to have you here, oh, thank and you. I'm, I know our audience is going to love your Beethoven oh. again, um, and I wish you well for your travels, and, you. Uh, and stay healthy, 
And uh, I know you've got all sorts of masks arranged for your <laughs> airplane journey. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, actually, uh, you, you need, sometimes you need two different layers. You need the medical one or N95 on top of your regular mask because sometimes it, maybe it's safer for you, but it's not safe for others. So, yeah, I mean, it, it's, of course, it's something we have to go through in order to keep everyone healthy. And um, if we all do that, I think this will soon be over. Well, I'm glad that your performance here today is uh, going to be a part of your legacy. And oh. we're so <laughs> thrilled that you're here in the wonderful Ambassador Auditorium. Yeah. So thank you again for being here. My pleasure. My pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. I, I just enjoyed playing here so much. And now I realize how much I miss being here. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.